This video is sponsored by Nebula. Okay, rolling. Lots of people follow this YouTube channel because of the vlogs I made during my PhD in atmospheric physics at the University of Exeter. Unfortunately, however, I had to graduate at some point, and that necessarily meant the end of my videos showing what doing a PhD was like. However, there are lots of people out there doing interesting PhD projects, and so in this video series, I'm spending a few days with a new researcher each episode, showing you what their life is like, learning a bit about them, and learning about the topic of their thesis. This time, I'm at the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College London, talking to Jesus, who is experimenting with an unusual rocket fuel, water. I'm a Jesus, I'm a PhD student at the Imperial College London, and I am in my third year of my PhD research. So my PhD is titled Computational and Experimental Characterization of Water Fuel Holofet Thrusters. In simple terms, what we are trying to do is to develop a spacecraft propulsion systems that instead of using normal propellants like the ones that are being flown in space right now, they are using water. In space propulsion systems, there are two main categories. You have chemical thrusters, which are the rockets you see every day like NASA and SpaceX with all this like massive burnout of propellant. And then you have electric propulsion systems, which is the ones I'm developing myself. So in chemical rockets, you have a chemical combustion and this is how you create propellant. In electrical systems, what you do is that uh, you create a plasma and then by sort of using electric or magnetic fields, then you accelerate the plasma, you get force from it. The good part about these systems, which are like uh, conducted by plasma, is that they are very, very efficient because a chemical reaction, let's say inefficiencies because it gener generates a lot of heat, it's also like energy being uncontrollably released from the bonds of the propellant. Whereas if you have electric propulsion system, what you have is something that is like very, very fine-tuned that you can generate a plasma and you just utilize most of it to actually generate thrust. But the disadvantage is that the thrust you produce from the systems is very, very, very small. You have a coin in your hand and the weight of the coin is more or less the thrust that these systems are producing. In a space, what happens is that as you don't have any kind of friction or whatsoever, you are like floating. If then you have a small coin pushing, if you keep that one pushing for like years, you build up a massive acceleration. And this is because something pushing for a very, very long time starts to accelerate the stuff more and more and more. And as there is nothing to stop it, at the end, you get a very, very high speed. This kind of technology is already used on spacecraft. For example, the recent DART mission used an ion thruster. The most commonly used fuel in these is the gas xenon, because it's massive, inert, not radioactive, and has a high ionization potential, meaning it's easy to rip an electron off and generate a plasma. But other noble gases like krypton are used too. Unfortunately, however, producing these gases is very energy intense and expensive, so Jesus is investigating alternative fuels that are a bit easier to come by. For example, the propellants that we use nowadays are very toxic, environmentally not friendly, and also they are very, very pricey. So we want to come up with a solution that solves all these problems, while it can also be found in the vicinity of the entire solar system. When I arrived, Jesus was actually repairing a component of the experiment that had developed a fault over the weekend, something that had to be fixed before we could film. That meant that he asked me to climb into the vacuum chamber to recalibrate a part of the experiment. Now this may surprise some of you, but I don't actually own a lab coat. It's not like a requirement to being a scientist that you own a lab coat. But I have been given for the shoot today, and I'm allowed to keep this, my very <laughs> own lab coat. So what I want you to do here, you're going to see that we have a laser, and this laser is in charge of measuring the displacement of this thrust balance. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, it's super slippery. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in uh, like a kid's playground. <laughs> A very, very expensive playground. So this whole slab moves slightly. So when the thruster is firing, you're going to see uh, this be pushed backwards. And you're going to measure that using this laser that's down here. So you bring it closer, it will start to turn green. And that means that the distance between the plate and the laser is right. So is green too close? The green is fine. Red is too far away and orange is like sweet. So now it's green and it's going to turn orange just for... Oh, oh, there you are. Yeah, perfect. Flashing orange, nice. Well, I honestly never thought doing this job <laughs> that I'd be recalibrating a component <laughs> in a plasma thruster experiment. <laughs> Here is a whole effect thruster. Let's say in very simple terms, it's a device that has an inlet in which the propellant in is being injected. And then it has a very specific magnetic field topology. So in this region that you see here, 
is, is where the plasma is being generated and it's being confined but all this uh, equipment that you see and then it's being expelled out of it. How do you actually generate the plasma? The whole effect thruster as itself, it means nothing, it's useless. We need to have something called a cathode, which is an electron gun or a neutralizer. This system is the one that is um, emitting electrons and the emission of electrons from this cathode is the one that is going to excite the plasma. And this collision between the electron and the neutral, if it is very energetic, can generate an ion. And then there is a snowball effect in which in, in case you have one ion, then you start generating two ions, three ions, and at the end you have plasma being expelled. The good part about our kind of equipment is that you only need to do this and then you have fuel for your spacecraft. What you can do is you ca can have any kind of system that changes from liquid water to water vapor and then water vapor is being ionized and this is how you propel your spacecraft with water vapor. The other alternative, instead of using water vapor, you can have a water electrolyzer in front of your spacecraft. Water electrolysis propulsion is very, very useful because you separate two propellants that serve two needs at the same time. Oxygen for the thruster, hydrogen for the cathode. There are several kinds of ion thrusters, and as he already mentioned, the thruster you just saw in the vacuum chamber, the subject of Jesus's PhD, is a specific kind that uses something called the Hall effect. The Hall effect is the movement of charged particles when they are in a perpendicular magnetic field. It's a very cool phenomenon because you have two things. You have the electric field and the electrons trying to go to one area, and then you have the magnetic field and the electrons are trying to gear it. So if you mix a straight line and a circle, what you have is a kind of ellipse. So it's like doing this kind of motion in which on one hand it wants to get out, but on the other hand it's being pushed to do this circular motion. And all this stuff is built up in this radius of the whole of the thruster so that we increase the amount of time that the electrons are inside of the channel. Because if the electrons are there for a long time, it's gonna be statistically more probable that you are gonna hit an electron with a neutral and it's gonna generate an ion. So by increasing the amount of time the electrons are within the channel, you are increasing the amount of prob probabilities of having an electron, an ion, and then therefore a plasma. Over the course of the day we filmed, we fixed the component and sealed the vacuum chamber and started pumping it down to very low pressure. After all, this is equipment designed to operate in space. It would be impossible to get the plasma engine to work at atmospheric pressure. That pumping down gave me a chance to ask Jesus about his background and the unusual way his PhD was financed. I studied in Spain, in Madrid, for my aerospace engineering background. And then I moved to the Netherlands, to TUDELF, and I studied there my master's degree. And then I moved to Switzerland at the CERN, the Particle Accelerator, two years there of work experience. And when I was working there, I was also working at the Swiss Space uh, Center, which is like the entity in Switzerland that manages all this sp space stuff. What happened was that I was in Switzerland with a very like general space lead. I said, I want to do a PhD like 100%, right? So he talked with my supervisor. I didn't have any funding and he accepted me as a PhD student being self-funded. At the start, I didn't have any funding, as I said. So I was like uh, here on my own and I took this chance because I love science and I wanted to do something that really like fills my heart. Um, and after one and a half years of like working here being self-funded, I got funding for my PhD. So the European Space Agency uh, found my project interesting and now I'm getting paid by them to conduct this experimentation. Do you play Kerbal Space Program? Oh yeah, I, I, that's a very good game. Played a little bit and it's quite realistic. Like the stuff you can generate there, apart from like dark matter and other kind of energy that uh, are not yet there yet, I think it's a very realistic software. Now, when Jesus emailed me about his project, he mentioned that we could generate some plasma and get the engine working for the camera. Great, but there was another facility at Imperial that he mentioned that got me really excited to visit. So why do you have a flight simulator? First of all, for the students of the first and second year to actually like experience what are actually the physics of motion of an aircraft. And also there are PhD students and professors that give like uh, do research on it. The good part is that you can model your own aircraft and you can see how you actually will perform in reality. So as a student, you can design an aircraft, you can put that into the system and then you can control that aircraft and see how it handles in a six-axis flight simulator. Yeah, precisely. We have a big project in first year. It's called Aerial Vehicle Design. And there's also one lab in second year, I think. You have to design a control system. An autopilot. <laughs> this is so cool. Does this have anything to do with plasma thrusters? No. But how many times do you get an opportunity to fly one of these? We're about to fly what I think is a fighter jet. Um, yes. This can only go well. 
<laughs> Locking the doors. Okay, that's on. All right, whenever you're ready, uh, Simon, press the start button. Ready? Ready. Full throttle. Really fast, by the way. Oh, well, you can actually feed. Uh, all right. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, current speed, back one. Uh, Whoa. Okay, I was not expecting to do that. So which direction we are heading west, is that correct? Let me double check, you are heading east. Uh, uh, whoa! Oh, God. Oh. Oh, God. <laughs> right, okay, down we go. We are buzzing central London at 400 feet. Oh, God! Oh, so my God. turbulence! Oh, good grief! Oh, my God! 600, 700 feet. 700 feet. Can I recommend decreasing the speed? Okay, right. oh, we are. You're going to be in charge of the parking brakes. That's a tree. That's, That's a building. Oh, no, no, no. We are bouncing around southeast of England. <laughs> I think we may have crashed. <laughs> oh, I feel a little bit motion sick. I won't lie. Oh, I, I, I do. Yeah, actually. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Azu. Yeah, that was amazing. Someone's glad that we're on solid ground. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is that we're going to try to ignite the thruster using oxygen. An oxygen, when we turn the plasma on, is going to be in a mix between green and yellow. And this is because every plasma bright has a certain wavelength that our eyes interpret as a different color. We are going to generate electric field between the thruster and the cathode. That's the first step. And the second one is that we're going to put propellant through the thruster. So the combination of the electric field plus the propellant is going to create this plasma that we're going to see. And the third step is to start the magnetic field. And when we start the magnetic field, we're going to have a whole effect thruster. Electric field, magnetic field, and a plasma in between them. And then what kind of force are you expecting to generate? Uh, today, probably 30 millinewtons, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I think the building will be all right. <laughs> Over the course of the afternoon, we fired up the plasma thruster dozens of times, testing putting different quantities of oxygen through the thruster. Depending on the concentration of oxygen plasma, it would appear anything from green to yellow, a bit like how the note of a car engine changes depending on the fuel mix you use, and generate slightly different amounts of thrust. But needless to say, it all looked awesome. So in the future, what we want to do is to put this stuff but into space. Right now, we are make, making sure that the efficiency levels and the technology is competitive. And once we have all this research done, what we want to do is to fly it in an actual spacecraft in orbit, put proof of concept, and then, yeah, commercialize it. If I will have to choose a space mission for this, probably I will choose to go to one of the moons of Jupiter. If you go there, you need something that is very, very efficient. So you cannot use like standard rocketry. And if you use whole effect thrusters, you can use this propellant for interplanetary missions or for example, going to Jupiter and explore one of the moons of Jupiter and possibly gather water from this planet in order, for example, to come back to Earth. My idea after my PhD is currently unknown. I would like to like keep working uh, in the space field, if possible. Like work for any space agency, I think that would be great. Otherwise, I might spread the word of science as you do and join your, your stuff, which is also very cool. Do you, th do you think you'll see this technology be used in the next couple of decades? Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, I think the time scale is probably being optimistic 10 years, being pessimistic maybe takes 20. It may be a decade or two from being used on a mission, but what you've seen today may not be the last time you see a water fueled spacecraft thruster. The next time might just be around one of Jupiter's moons. Putting these videos together is tough, because every one of the PhD students I've featured in this series have had such interesting stories to tell, and you can only cover so much in a video. For example, this isn't Jesus' only research project. Previously, he worked on transformable spacecraft, and was even invited to fly a prototype of one on a microgravity flight by the European Space Agency. He talks about this, as well as giving advice to prospective PhD students, in an extra video I've uploaded to my Nebula page. Most episodes of this series actually have such bonus content on Nebula, which is the streaming service I am lucky enough to run with a team of creative friends. Over 600,000 people have signed up to Nebula, and it's not hard to see why 
why. There are over 100 educational creators uploading their videos to Nebula, so it's got tons of exclusive content, like my extended videos, but also Nebula originals, such as Abby Thorne's The Prince, Extremities, and Great Cities. So it's like the section of YouTube you already watch, but with bonus content and with no adverts whatsoever. Nebula instead operates on a subscription model, with your subscription fee divided between the creators you watch. So by signing up and watching videos from me, you directly support this series and further videos from me. If you sign up with my link in the description, you get an amazing 40% discount on a yearly subscription, meaning you can support my videos, stop seeing adverts on videos from your favorite creators, and be introduced to new series and new faces for just $2.50 a month. And for that $2.50 a month, you also get free access to Nebula Classes, where Nebula creators show you behind the curtain and how they make videos in in-depth lessons. It may well be the best money you spend this year, and while I would certainly appreciate it if you went to go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark, I think you are going to appreciate it too. Thank you for watching the video, and thank you of course to Jesus for being so generous with his time and letting me on that flight simulator. If you enjoyed the video, please do pop it a like and share it with your friends who you think may be interested. But also, do check out previous episodes of this series, linked on the screen and in the description. That just leaves me to say thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.